we plan to do or what we desire to do, but all because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And yet the Christian life is not a passive life, and and we've been talking about that, the active life of of a follower of Jesus for the last five weeks and now concluding in the sixth week. And so I would like for us, I'm going to read the call to, and then I would like for you to talk about the activity uh, that we as disciples of Jesus are to do. So call to, call to, call to, call to. Call to, Serve others. call to, Reproduce disciples. and that's the last in our series, and, and we're going to be looking at not only the Great Commission, but the Great Commission in light of Acts chapter 14, where we see that lived out in the lives of God's people, that we are called to reproduce, that as disciples of Jesus, we are called to make disciples of Jesus. And so before we lift up our voices in song, we take a moment to greet one another. You'll see that in our um, worship order in your in your bulletin. It, we're starting with uh, the Old Testament scripture this morning, which is really a call to worship as well, uh, of God reminding us of who we are to be as the people of God. And so Karen will read this Deuteronomy text, and then we'll go into singing to our great God. Our Old Testament reading is taken from the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, starting with the fourth verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. So our first song is one that we've sung with you before. It's called Immortal Invisible. It's got similar language to that hymn, but it um, also has some interesting language. As you'll hear in the third verse, it says, Immortal, yet you once died for me to pay my debt to set me free. Invisible, you will not always be because you're coming to reign as our king. Amen? So let us come before the Lord with joyful noise and hopefully music as well (laughs) this morning. very 
once died for me to pay my debt to set me free invisible you will not always be cause you're coming to reign as our king and the saints will fall down at your feet you're the god of the God that we come before, this awesome God of the ages that we've been called to submit to and follow. And this next song is a new song that we are glad to teach you um, this morning. I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to sing the, um, the verse so that you hear the tune and then have you sing it with us once before we go into the song because it's very simple. But it's all about how it's God who is at work within us that will enable us to follow, that will enable us to reproduce disciples, that will enable us to abide in Jesus and bear fruitful lives. And so here's, I'm just going to play it first. Here's how the, um, the verse goes. So now Erica and Karen and I will sing it. And if you've got it, sing along with the, just the verse. And then we'll do it um, all together. So here it is. Greater is the one who's in us. Greater is the one who calls our name. He will never fail. Isn't that good news enough? We could say amen. He will never fail, but we have much more to sing. But we've got the melody, now you've got the <laughs> tune, so let's sing it unto the Lord.
It is because of his never-failing love that we have the confidence to come before him and to confess that we have not done all that he has asked of us and all that is expected to us. But to know that as we make that confession that his love for us never fails, that his mercies come to us new each and every moment. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Together we pray. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. St. John reminds us in his first letter of the hope that is ours in the face of our sin, that we have one who speaks on our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, that he is the atoning sacrifice, not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the world. And it is in the name of this righteous one, Jesus Christ, and for his sake that I declare to you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Karen, let's project the chorus to that last song again, For Your Love. seated as we continue in our worship. The New Testament reading is taken from the 14th chapter of Acts, starting at the 20th verse. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch 
strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. come to Church, arise. 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. This is the gospel of our Lord. great hymns of the Christian faith series and so throughout the next coming Sundays we'll be singing one of the great hymns of the faith starting with today lift high the cross I invite you to open up the hymnal and follow along on page 837 we're doing verses 1 2 5 or 6 the verses will also be projected on the screen <laughs> seated. At this time, I invite the children to come forward. What does that say? Wave something? Your shirt. You don't know. How many of you play a sport? 
You play softball? And basketball. And basketball. Swimming. Swimming. Soccer and golf. Do any of you have coaches for those sports? Yeah. Do coaches do anything besides yell? What do they do? Okay, so in a game, but, but do coaches help in practice? So if you're playing soccer, the coach will teach you the correct way to kick the ball. Is there a correct way to kick the ball? Okay, well, that's like a coach. Is there a correct way to swing the bat and to shoot the ball? Yeah. So coaches help you to become better players, right? And if you have a music teacher, music teachers help you to become a better musician, right? What are we supposed to do for each other? Oh, no. <laughs> I know you. I have to be quicker. But we're kind of supposed to be like coaches to each other. That we're supposed to help one another to get better at following Jesus. And so it's not only telling each other, did you know that Jesus died for you? Did you know that you have eternal life in Jesus? I mean, those are important things for us to know. Absolutely. But we need people to help us to learn what it means to follow this Jesus, to follow the one who has forgiven us, to follow the one who is leading us to eternal life. And so that's why God has given us Christian parents, and that's why he's given us teachers and, and other people at church. They're like our coaches, that they help us to become better disciples of Jesus Christ. Who's been a Christian coach for you? Okay, Sunday school teachers. What about you? You've been a coach to yourself? Ooh, you're self-motivated. I like that. I don't know. You don't know? How about your dad? Doesn't he help you to live out the Christian life? By his example and by his words? Absolute, absolutely. And you know what? You are helping other people to live out the Christian life. That as we see your life and as we hear your, your testimony, that encourages the rest of us. So it's not just like people who are older are doing it for people who are younger. But Jesus has designed it so that together we can encourage each other to follow him. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the people that you have put in our lives, coaches to help us become better athletes, teachers that help us to become better musicians, and the Christians that you have placed in our lives that remind us of your love, that encourage us, and that encourage us to follow you more closely. Continue to grant us your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, that we might know you and that we might love you, and that we might live for you, even as you lived and died for us and are living evermore. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. The Confirmands and I are currently studying the Ten Commandments. Anybody remember what we studied this last Tuesday? Which commandment were we on? The Third Commandment. Very good. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Uh, sometime in November, we're going to tackle the Sixth Commandment, you shall not commit adultery which is always a, uh, an interesting time when you have 7th and 8th graders. Here we are wrestling with you shall not commit adultery. And in that particular class, uh, I, I emphasize the gifts of sex and marriage, God's intended purposes and designs. And two of the questions I always ask at the start of that class is, what do you know about sex and who taught you? Or where did you learn it? And about that time, anybody who's been talking is now silent and understandably so, what is pastor asking those kinds of questions for? And after a pregnant pause, we'll, we'll just lay it out there, after a pregnant pause, you got to have a little fun, right? Um, 
people began to warm up a little bit, at least in terms of the second question. Not so much the first one, but the second question. And they'll mention, well, I learned about the birds and the bees or about sex and reproduction from health class or maybe somebody left a book for me on the table. And occasionally someone will say, my mom or dad gave me the talk. As if it were one conversation, the talk. And some of you have experienced the talk and some of you have given the talk. Uh, Parents, by and large, mm, They have trouble completing sentences, and they look helplessly out of their elements, and the kids don't fare much better. They have visible signs of distress, and by and large, everybody's glad when the talk is over. It's like, check it off the list, never, ever again. Was that any of yours experiences growing up? I'm still waiting for the talk. So, is it, we, we recording mom, dad, I'm still waiting. <laughs> I learned about it on the bus, which is never a good thing. <laughs> but as you think about that, you know, it's one of those conversations that, that ought to be um, a heartfelt conversation, uh, a good conversation, and part of it is starting far earlier than waiting until they're, they're at that age, uh, because then it's just devastating. But it's nothing that we should be ashamed about. It's it's, it's a beautiful thing, a wonderful thing, as long as it's used within the context and confines in which God has given us. Remember, it's God's idea. In the beginning, God created male and female. God created men and women so that they might become one flesh, so that by the power of his word and according to his plan, that they might be fruitful and multiply, so that together they might reproduce. And I bring that up because we need to understand that as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to reproduce. And this too is by divine design. And as we talk about disciple making, and this is the last in our series on discipleship, as we talk about mentoring other believers in Jesus Christ, hopefully none of you will have visible signs of distress. And hopefully none of you will be glad, I'm glad that talk is over. And hopefully none of us will be content to be spiritual eunuchs, to live lives of spiritual barrenness. Stated positively, hopefully all of us will embrace this particular aspect of what it means to follow Jesus. And more than that, hopefully all of us will see that we are, by God's grace, already engaged in this most blessed work. Certain Bible passages, as you know, are difficult to understand or hard to apply to our living, and then there are times in which it's both. And I thought that if we can switch over, please... I think this is one of the best examples of a passage that is hard to understand and hard to apply. (laughs) Uh, In this wonderful chapter in in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, where Paul's talking about the resurrection, uh, towards the close of that, he says, Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And we say, huh? You didn't even know that was in there, did you, some of you? It's like, that's in the Bible? What does that mean, and how in the world do we begin to apply it to our lives? Are we to be like the Mormons and baptize dead people via proxy? No. So there are some passages that are hard to understand and difficult to apply, or both, and this is a category in which it is both. But when it comes to the Great Commission, as it is often called, there is no confusion, is there? Jesus lays out a clear directive that if we are disciples of Jesus Christ, we are to make what? Disciples of Jesus Christ. That we are to make and encourage and strengthen other disciples of Jesus Christ. 
And just as the Lord enabled Adam and Eve to obey the command to be fruitful and multiply, so too Jesus' presence among us and his life-giving power enables us to make other disciples. And it struck me as I, as I was selecting text for this sermon series and this particular um, sermon is that the Great Commission laid out for us in Acts chapter 20, or not Acts chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, is seen clearly lived out in the lives of Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 14. That the command of Jesus and the promise of Jesus are lived out, acted out in the lives of God's people at that particular time. And so let's take a look. Uh, it begins with the next day Paul and Barnabas left for Derby. So, so the beginning of the Great Commission is therefore what? Therefore go. And the next day Paul and Barnabas left for Derby. That sounds a whole lot like going. And as we look at the, the history of the early church and Acts and other writings, we see that God's people took Jesus' command to heart that they were a church on the move, they were a people on the go. And I will say that I am privileged to serve and minister among you and with you because we as a congregation are a congregation on the go. Praise God. Because that cannot be said of many congregations. But this is a congregation who gets the Great Commission. This is a congregation that is on the go. And as the text continues, it says they, they preached the gospel in that city in Derby and won or made a large number of disciples. And, and we need to, to pay attention to those first four words. They preached the what? Because we live in an age in which people are always trying to devise the next great marketing strategy. And so they didn't rely on clever marketing strategies, and they didn't seek to impress the people with their oratory skills. They preached the gospel. And why did they preach the gospel? Because they recognized that it was the power of God for salvation for all who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. And we ourselves, hopefully everybody who is gathered here, has experienced firsthand the saving power of the gospel. And that is why we are here. As Paul writes that we who were once dead in our transgressions and sins have been made alive in Christ Jesus. Matt, have you been made alive in Christ Jesus? Amen. And the reason why is because the gospel has impressed upon your life at home and here and other places. And we are here because the gospel saving power has been manifest in our lives. We were dead and our transgressions and sins have been made alive in Christ. That we who were once objects of God's wrath, Ephesians chapter 2, are now objects of God's affections. And because of his affections, because we are no longer dead in our transgressions and sins, we are no longer to wallow in sin, in its shame and in its destructive forces, but rather we are to rejoice that no matter what we have done and no matter what we have failed to do, that there is for us forgiveness free and full in Jesus. And we who have experienced the saving power of the gospel are to share that message with others that they too might be born again, that they too might be uh, made alive with Christ Jesus. It's not going to be our marketing strategies, and it's not going to be how clever we are in our speaking. It's going to be in our willingness to share the gospel because we believe that it too is the power of salvation for all who believe. But notice as it moves on, it says, they, again, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Paul and Barnabas did not consider their work completed when disciples were made. They continued to return to those cities where disciples were made so that they might strengthen and encourage those disciples to remain true to the faith. It is not enough 
for us as a congregation to baptize. And it is not enough in some Christian traditions for people to give their lives to Jesus. Because I've personally baptized many, many babies and children over the years, and their parents have not made good on the promise that they made on that baptismal day that they would raise their children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. That they would come among God's people so that they would grow in grace and knowledge. And I have been to evangelistic outreaches and I have seen hundreds of people pour down to the stage at the very end and they have given their lives to Jesus. But in the absence of follow-up, without ongoing support, when that newfound faith is tested as it always is, it almost always fails. And they begin to live their lives as if Jesus didn't even exist. Nurturing others in the faith, nurturing, mentoring disciples of Jesus is paramount for us. It is an essential aspect of what it means for us to follow Jesus. I mean, think about it in this way. When mothers give birth to their children and their, uh, the, the baby is, is finally laid on their chest, they don't say, my work is done. In truth, it's just beginning. And the same is true for us in our interaction with other believers, other followers of Jesus Christ. Our work is not yet done because we are not yet done. Both of us need to be mentored and both of us need to mentor. And thanks be to God, that's precisely what many of you are already doing, even if you're not aware of that fact. Those of you that work with the preschoolers or teach the older kids in Kids Connection, you're not just simply teaching them Bible stories. You are discipling them. And those of you that lead in Pulse and facilitate one of our small groups, you are mentoring fellow followers of Jesus. And the work that Connie and Erica do and the work that Lynn and Bill do, they're not merely providing an avenue whereby people who are struggling with divorce can find a listening ear and those who are dealing with grief can find an outlet. They are seeking to strengthen and encourage believers to remain true to the faith. And whenever you meet with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and they lay out before you family problems or health issues or things that aren't going well at work and as you sit there and and try to be a good listener and seek to, to, to offer godly counsel, you're doing more than that. You are mentoring them. On and on it goes. We we could we could talk about the different situations in which we find ourselves. In the ways in which we do it, we do it one-on-one in person, over the phone, or via the internet, with individuals, or groups, or couples. And in all of those things, we are seeking to strengthen and encourage them that they, like us, would remain true to the call to follow Jesus. Parents, especially those of you who still have children at home, you are in a prime position to mentor your children. Grandparents, in many cases, you are in a prime position to mentor your grandchildren in the faith. That as you share life together, as we heard in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you are to impress the gospel of Jesus Christ upon their hearts and their minds. That it's to be a part of your daily conversation. That as you live life together, you are to keep Jesus Christ crucified and risen before their eyes, reminding them daily that they are loved. And when they do what they're not supposed to do, or they don't do what they're supposed to do, you need to remind them and assure them in those moments that there is forgiveness for them free and full. 
teach them by your words and train them by your actions what it means to follow Jesus. And having said that, I recognize that many of us feel ill-equipped to mentor anybody, even our own children and grandchildren. And if that is true for you, then take to heart the promise that Jesus has made to all of us. He has promised to be with us always, even until the end of the ages. And all of the promises Jesus makes are true and certain. Amen? That none of the promises Jesus has made to us are empty. They're not vain. They're not null. And we see that in this text in which Jesus kept that promise to Peter and Barnabas. On arriving there in Antioch, they, Paul and Barnabas, gathered the church together and reported. And I would like for you to read with me the last section. Reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door faith to the Gentiles. Who was doing the heavy lifting? All that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of the faith to the Gentiles. The same God who worked through them and the same God who was opening up doorways that people might become disciples and be matured as disciples of Jesus Christ. is the same God who is choosing to work through us. And the same God who continues to open doorways for us. You may not be able to remember back six weeks, but we began this series with God, uh, with his gracious work for us and in us and through us. And that's where we're going to end the series, with God's gracious work in us and for us and through us. That in his grace, God has called us to follow Jesus. Not because we're bright, not because we're good looking, not because we're anything, because he is a God of grace and love. That in grace, God has called us to follow Jesus, to follow the one who submitted himself to the Father's will, becoming obedient unto death, even death by crucifixion, to follow the one who lived his earthly life in close-knit community, to follow the one who grew in grace and wisdom before God and men, to follow the one who rendered the ultimate act of service by giving his life as a ransom for us, to follow the one who has poured out his spirit upon us that we might know him and that we might follow him. In his grace, God the Father has called us to follow Jesus. And in following Jesus, we are learning together how to submit to Jesus. And we are growing together as those who are following Jesus. And we are learning together what it means to serve and what it means to reproduce. That together, by God's design, And by God's plan, empowered by his word and his spirit, we are maturing disciples of Jesus, even as we seek to make disciples of all nations. Let us pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, there are undoubtedly other ways in which you could have carried out your plans and purposes in our world. but you have chosen to work through us. And as we think about those first men and women you chose and the way in which you worked through them, how the gospel went out from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, how Paul and Barnabas and others traveled to Pamphylia and Perga, Perga, and other places, and as they shared that powerful gospel message that lives were changed in time and for eternity. And we are those who have benefited from that ongoing process of making disciples. And we are privileged to share in the process of yet making other disciples and mentoring those you have already brought to faith. 
Help us, Lord, not to shirk our duty, not to think it is beyond us because it's what you have chosen and it is what you have chosen to empower us to do. And so let us celebrate what you have done and let us look forward to what you desire to do and let us believe that the gospel is enough and let us share that gospel with others that they might be strengthened in their walk with you, that they might be encouraged to remain true to the faith, and that others, yes, that others, many others around the globe would become disciples even as we are, and that one day together we may stand before your glorious throne and receive the fullness of all that you have done for us on the cross, Lord Jesus, and in the empty tomb. To you be the praise and the glory now and forever. Amen.